Hello. This is Pastor Nick Hood, and I just want you to know that worship is about to begin. Pick up your telephone, call a friend, tell them Nick Hood's on the line. We're getting ready to start worship. And today my sermon is entitled, Live Your Best Life Now. Not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, but right now. Because who knows, you may not be alive next year. Uh, you may not be alive next month. And so make the most out of this time. Make the most out of this moment. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's what I'm trying to do in life. I'm just trying to make the most out of every minute of life. And I'm using the text from John chapter 10, uh, I, uh, verse 10. I come that you might have life, might have life more abundantly. I'm going to break this verse down. And I'm, I'm hoping to give encouragement to any person who feels like life is not worth living, who feels like they've wasted their life, who feels like uh, they're a disappointment. And I want you to know something. God is not disappointed in you. God is a God of sinners. God is a God for people who have made mistakes. God is a God who, for people who sometimes have not lived up to their potential. And so what I'm going to be talking to you about are some of the scriptures that Jesus gives us about uh, why we should look forward to life, why we should believe that we can live our best life now. Not when you die, not in the by and by, but right now. We'll be starting worship in just a moment. God bless, God keep you. Remember, I am praying for you.
I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, then lead me in the path everlasting. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us all be glad and rejoice in it. It's raining outside here in Detroit, but it's hot and we're on fire right inside the Plymouth United Church of Christ. So welcome to worship this day. I present to you now the Gospel Choir, the Plymouth United Church of Christ.
coming back into the church. Uh, one day, I hope soon, we'll have a great camp meeting and invite everybody in. But, you know, back in July, we suffered a major flood at the church and uh, with sewage all through the lower level, about two and a half feet. And uh, we have to make sure that the air quality is right uh, before we bring everybody back. But I want to thank the gospel choir for being with us today. Amen. My sermon in today is entitled, Live Your Best Life Now. Live your best life now. Not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, but right now. I heard the voice of Jesus say in John chapter 10, verse 10, I come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. I believe that if we ask different people what they were looking for out of life, most would probably say some word that connotes with happiness. Some might say, all I want is peace. Another person might say, just give me more money. Another person would say, if I just had something to eat, I'd be happy. Another person would say, give me a little more sex. Give me a bigger house. Give me a nicer car. 
But if you boil each of these words down, they connote in my mind to happiness. And the reality is that many people in life are not happy. And if you don't believe me, look at the rates of suicide. Uh, the rates of suicide are going up in the United States. And I believe they're going up because there are many people who are at their very core are not happy. And there's a theological underpinning to suicide. I don't know if anybody here has ever contemplated taking their life. But let me give you the theological argument for suicide. It goes like this. Uh, some people call it uh, a teleological suspension of the ethical. Wow, think about that. My brother told me, don't use words like that. <laughs> but that's why I went to school. <laughs> Number one, uh, and this is also known as uh, the argument for theodicy, or an evil God. Number one, if God is all good, number two, if God is all knowing, and number three, uh, if God is all powerful, then why is my life so messed up? Let me say it again. If God is all good, if God is all knowing, and if God is all powerful, then why is my life messed up? The suicide victim is the person who goes through those three suppositions. And at the end, all they can say is, either God is irrelevant or God does not exist. And if God is irrelevant, if God does not exist, then why worry about going to hell? Why worry about killing myself? And then the next step is, they actually do that. And so we come back to this question for today. How can I live my best life now? And I look at all the people here, uh, and there are not many. Uh, but I look at the choir, you who are here today. And I know many of you. I've been with many of you in some of your worst moments. And you haven't killed yourself. And if you haven't killed yourself, why? Why? And I believe that uh, most unhappy people are not necessarily suicidal. You know, you can go through those same three points that I just made. If God is good, if God is all powerful, and if God is all knowing, then why is my life messed up? But even so, you're not killing yourself. And there's, that is the statement of faith. The person uh, with a core of faith goes through those three points. And they say, but I believe anyhow. Uh, I believe uh, in the mystery of Jesus Christ. I believe in the salvation of Jesus Christ. I believe in the hope of Jesus Christ. And because I believe, I am not checking out a life any time before God calls me. Uh, we move from one thing to another, seeking joy. When I look at the television, I see a television full of commercials encouraging the viewer to seek and to find a better night, better life. Uh, and it's all in the products that are being sold. If you seek a stronger memory, memory try privileges. And all the people on Privilege and on TV said, I've been on, my wife and I have been on this for eight or more years. I never heard of Privilege until I looked at TV. I said, where did these people find out about Privilege? Uh, have acid reflux? Try, is it Prilosec? Prilosec? Prilosec. Somebody here knows about that. Erectile dysfunction. Try Viagra or Cialis. If you want to get rid of wrinkles, try Botox. Uh, got diabetes? They have a whole list of products for you. Thinning hair? Try Rogaine. You have gray hair? They have stuff for that too. 
And if you want stronger bones for your dog, try this or that. There's something for everything in life. And somebody wants to make money off of your unhappiness. The heart and the soul of the message of Jesus is simple. Follow me and I will give you abundant life. When Jesus says, I come that you may have life and life more abundantly, that's what he's saying. He said, follow me and I'm going to show you happiness. Follow me and I will give you joy. Follow me and I will give you meaning and purpose and fulfillment out of life. Uh, but you have to come to me. Uh, listen, but that's not the only place where Jesus says that. I hear him in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 say, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, My peace I leave with thee, my peace I give unto thee. Not as the world gives, give I. But you know, some of us get the message of Jesus all wrong. We focus on heaven, but we forget about earth. We're so, you know, heavenly bound, we're no earthly good. And if a person is only stuck on heaven, uh, I think what they're doing is theologically excusing the mess in their life. Uh, you know, when a person says, well, one day uh, it'll all be worthwhile. I said, no, that's not what Jesus is saying. He says, I come that you might have abundant life. I've heard some people theologically trying to excuse, trying to interpret, and I think it's a misinterpretation of that text. When they say, well, what Jesus is really saying is you'll have abundant life when you die. I said, no. Uh, yes. It's yes and no. It's no. That's not what Jesus is saying. But yes, it is what he's saying. He's saying when you die, you're going to have life e extraordinary. You're going to have life unlike anything you ever imagined. But what Jesus is also saying is, I came that you might have abundant life. And I would add another word, right now. Right now. Uh, I don't hear Jesus say, wait. Um, people who focus only on heaven pervert and cheapen the message of Jesus. Uh, I give you one of the earthly challenges that I think if the Lord were standing in our face right now, he'd be saying is, if you are a person of color, uh, if you are not a person of color, but a person of goodwill and equity and fairness, you'd be interested in the whole redistricting process that's happening throughout the United States right now. Now, what am I talking about? What I'm talking about is that every 10 years, there's a census. And why the census is so important is it helps every state figure out how many representatives they get in Congress. That's what it is right now. And we're going through that process right now. Uh, every state in America, and there are people who are looking at this from Florida, from Washington, D.C., from California, uh, Tennessee, uh, North Carolina. I know you're looking at this because you tell me you're looking at this. Uh, but I'm talking also to the people right here in Detroit. Tomorrow, tomorrow in Michigan, in Lansing, there will be here, tomorrow and Tuesday, I believe, there will be hearings in Lansing talking about wanting to hear from you, you and me. Uh, and what they want to know is, what do you think about the reapportionment process? Do you think it's fair? Right now, the way, from what I understand, we've got a young man in our church who's a state senator, Adam Ollier. And Ollier uh, contacted me this week, week. He said, Reverend Hood, would you be willing to testify tomorrow in Lansing about uh, the disappropriateness of the reapportionment process to make sure that people of color are included. And I said, Adam, of course I will do that. And then he said, would you also send it out to the church? I said, yes. So those of you who haven't read my email that I sent out, uh, only 140 people read it as of this morning. Uh, but take a look at it because I sent it to you. It has the link. You don't have to drive to Lansing. You can just go on the link and just sign up 
and tell people you want a fair process. Uh, now, some Christians would say, but Reverend, I didn't sign up for that. You know, all I want to know is my Jesus. But I believe that Jesus was a Jesus of the poor. Jesus was a Jesus of the oppressed. Jesus was a Jesus of the people who are left out, shut out, uh, and stomped out. And that means you and me. And so I encourage you to think about it and let your voice uh, be heard. But now if Congress seems too far away, let me bring it a little closer to home. I was telling Sister Pat Williams Tate Usury before the service today. She's on our media team. I, you know, we're talking about the new Myers. Um, for those of you looking at this who aren't in Detroit, we're opening a new Meyer. It just opened uh, this past week on East Jefferson near Rivard. And uh, that Myers is significant because it ratchets up uh, the notch in terms of high quality groceries. Now they're, they're gonna sell a lot of other stuff other than groceries. But right now, the thing, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about buying a high-grade shovel. You know, I'm not <laughs> worried about buying uh, a better screwdriver. Uh, all I want is some groceries and living in, and that are fresh and produce and meat uh, that is fresh and doesn't look brown and, you know, and doesn't look worn out and, and bloody. And, you know, I think that the merchants in Detroit have gotten away with a monopoly. And so by bringing in a high-grade grocery store, it forces everybody to kick it up a notch. Now, groceries are one thing, but the other one is gasoline. The other night, uh, my wife went out with her girlfriend, and they had a long-awaited dinner. Uh, but neither of them wanted to drive at night, and uh, so uh, my wife called me and she said, I'm going to drive us back to our house. She drove. She said, but you know, it's getting dark and I don't want to drive in the dark. Will you drive me? And I look at her and I say, Denise, all you want me for are my eyes. <laughs> I said, all you want me for is my body. But tonight, what you really want are my eyes. Uh, because they are still working. <laughs> so I dutifully came out of the house. I got into Denise's car. And, you know, I began to drive her and her girlfriend to the girlfriend's house. Well, the girlfriend lives on Seven Mile near Conley. On Conley near Seven Mile. And so, I don't know if you know Detroit, but that's uh, the Conant Gardens area. It's about maybe seven miles from my house. And so, something told me, I said, Nick, look at the gasoline gauge. And I looked at the gasoline gauge, and it was almost beyond empty. And I said, you know, it's one thing to run out of gas, but I don't want to run out of gas where I'm going at night. And so, you know, we drove the girlfriend home, and after we let her out, now we're on Seven Mile in Conley. And the question is, where do you get gas? And it was about 10.30 at night. So I said, well, we'll just go to the, the Myers at Eight Mile. And that's out of the way from my house. That's going a mile and some north and, and uh, west from my house. So we go up there, and lo and behold, the Myers gas station was closed. And I said, oh Lord, it's on now. And so I noticed that there was a BP station on Eight Mile on the north side, the Ferndale side of, of Eight Mile. So I do the U-turn and I go there and I'm saying to myself, Lord, don't let me get killed tonight. And so, you know, I pull up to the gas station and Denise says, are you going to get gas here? And I said, I don't think I have much choice. Uh, but when I got out of the car, there was a guy, and I, I, should, I shouldn't describe people like this, but he was a big, burly white man with a bald head. He had on a black suit, just like what I have on now. He had on a white shirt, just like what I have on now. He had on some kind of tie, 
and he had one of those stick-on name tags. And, but his shirt, his coat wasn't buttoned up like I have mine buttoned up. His coat was like this. And I don't know if you ever looked at the Secret Service. <laughs> they never button their coats. If you look at people who are in private protection, they never button their coats because they want to get to the gun quickly. And that brother was out there with his big bald head pumping his gas. And I'm saying to myself, he looks like he's inviting trouble. Uh, it's almost like he's saying, you want to mess with me? Come on. And I'm saying to myself, anybody like that who's bold enough and brash enough to get his gas on eight mile near Woodward uh, at 1030, almost 11 o'clock at night, I said, it's going to be all right. And so I pump my gas. And uh, we get in it, and we go home. But what is the point that I'm making? The point that I'm making is I'm preaching about living your best life now. My best life now is not to have to go to 8 Mile in Ferndale to get gas. My best life now is to be able to get gas in the ghetto as freely as in Ferndale. And that, my friends, is what excites me about the new Myers coming to Detroit. Now, I know a lot of you live, you know, who are looking at this, live outside of Detroit. Uh, and once you move, you probably don't worry the same way I worry. But I refuse to go inside a gas station to pay for gas. If I can't pay for it at the pump, I don't go in. I refuse to eat food that looks like it's spoiled. You know, I say, I'm too old to be doing that, you know? And I'm too healthy to be doing that. And so the point that I'm making, my friends, is the first step in living your best life now is taking an assessment of how you do live, and on every level. Uh, one level is, can I buy gas? Another level is, can I buy underwear in Detroit? You think I'm making, making that up? <laughs> That, that is real. You know, where are we going to buy nice socks in Detroit? And I didn't come here today intending to bash Detroit, because that's, that's not my assessment, and that's not my hope. It's not my purpose. The purpose that I'm saying is, if you and I are going to live our best lives possible and to live our best lives right now, it starts with an assessment of how am I living. Uh, what is my neighborhood really like? Uh, do the street lights work? Are the police courteous? Uh, you know, what are the schools like? What, are the, what is the retail shopping like? Where I live right now? Uh, and again, I, I'm not beating up the city. As a young black woman who opened up a restaurant literally at the corner of my block on Jefferson. It's called Ivy. I encourage you, go check it out. If you haven't checked out Ivy, go check it out. Uh, but to me, that's all part of a quality of life. Why do I have to drive 10 miles to go to a nice restaurant? But there's a young black woman who's done that on East Jefferson. Uh, if I'm going to live my best life now, then I've got to assess the quality of my personal relationships. Uh, you know, if you're married, start with your husband. Start with your wife. If you're dating, start with your lover. And ask yourself, what's the quality of this relationship? Uh, what's the quality of my family ties? Uh, you know, with my children, with my parents, with my brothers and sisters. Uh, I can't tell you the number of people I've been talking to just recently who are suffering because somebody in the family died uh, and the rest of the family won't come together. These are not church members. <laughs> I'm not talking about anybody in the church. But I have seen that in the church. Uh, what's the quality of my work life? A lot of people aren't coming back to, to work because they're saying, I don't get paid enough. Uh, I, I went to a restaurant, not, well, I'll tell you who it is, uh, the traffic jam the other day. I just assumed they were still closed or on a partial reopening. So I ate lunch at home. And then 
But, you know, I was going to meet a young man in the church. He was going to help me uh, tune up, you know, my, my web presence on the Internet. Uh, and so I said, I need, you know, to bring him something, plus I want a cookie. And uh, so I went to the traffic jam. And when I go to the, this time to the traffic jam, I went there only for a cookie because I had lowered my expectations. But when I got there, they had about five different kinds of cookies. And I bought four. I bought, and because I said, when I get to this house where I'm going, I'm going to leave them three cookies and I'm going to take one. And on the way, I dialed on my speed dial the owner of the traffic jam, who I know, a lady named Carolyn. And I said, Carolyn, I just wanted to call to encourage you. And she said, well, that's nice. And uh, I said, no, seriously. I said, I just stopped at your restaurant and I bought four cookies. And uh, I, you know, I was pleasantly surprised to see that you're offering full service, you know, that you can dine in or you can dine outside. And she said, yes. She said, but Reverend, I'm having a hard time. And I said, what's your hard time? She said, my hard time is that I can't get people to come to work. You know, and I knew where she was going with that, and I encouraged her, and I told her, keep on, you know, hanging in there, and I'm going to be back and get lunch one day. But then I, as I put the phone down, I started thinking about it. I said, you know, her problem is the problem across America and the world. People who have been underpaid uh, and, and not compensated that well are finally learning through the Biden administration that if you can get $600 a week for being unemployed, uh, that's, a, that's a big deal. And, you know, if you were really working at a marginal level, and what is telling the restaurant tours like the Traffic Jam and Ivy and all of these other places is you have to pay people a fair wage. You gotta pay them a fair wage. And for the last 50 or 60 years, restaurant workers have been working for almost nothing. When the minimum wage was $3, my first job was a $3 an hour uh, minimum wage job at Sam's, uh, Sam's department store downtown. And uh, Brother Walter, I know you remember that, Sam's and Michael, but uh, I got paid $3 an hour, but I didn't realize that the people who worked in the restaurants made about a dollar an hour in the assumption that they would make it up in tips. And so America, the American economy is coming to reality. And the reality is people don't want to work for a dollar. They don't want to work for $2 an hour. Uh, and you got to think very seriously if you are in the business of hiring people how much are you going to pay? And, and if you have to pay more, that means you have to charge more. And this is a great day of reckoning for the country. But if we are going to live our best lives now, we have to figure out what does it really cost for me to operate? What does it really cost for me to live? And every day of life is unique. Every day of life is particular. And part of living your best life possible is making a plan for every day, every stage, every age of life. And not only making a plan, but then once you make a plan, you have to reevaluate the plan. My father lived to 92, almost 93 years of age. And when he turned 70, I remember distinctly my father looking at me and said, Nick, I need to make a 20-year plan. I said, no, Dad, you don't need a 20-year plan. You need a 30-year plan. He said, what do you mean? I said, because I fully expect you to live beyond 90 years of age. Uh, and it sounded like a joke back then. But as my father got closer and closer to 90, he began to confide to me. He said, Nick, I got a problem. And I said, what's your problem? He says, I figured out how to make it to 90. He said, but what I didn't calculate was that I might live beyond 90. And, you know, we laughed about that, but uh, Sister Pat, he lived in your complex, the riverfront complex. And 
he and his wife bought two units together. And it was spacious, it was beautiful. Uh, they could look out at the sunrise in the east over the Detroit River. They could look to the west and watch the sun setting over the Ambassador Bridge. And that did them well for 20 years. But as they got closer and closer to 90, his savings were getting eaten up and I, I don't know, pension or whatever, maybe it was just the cost of living, where they were living. But he really worried about that. He said, how in the world am I gonna make it? Because this is beyond my plan. And as it turned out, he died two years later. And what's the point that I'm making? The point that I'm making, my friends, is that you and I have to adjust. We have to evaluate and reevaluate every day, every stage, every time of our lives. Uh, you think you got it together. And, and for those of you who are young, you have children in the house. Uh, and you can do very well. But at some point, the children may want to go to college. Uh, at some point, uh, you know, your situation may change. Uh, some, I know a lot of people who have made it uh, to retirement age, uh, but then they get retired and they realize they didn't have enough money. Uh, and so at every, they, some people I know do very well as long as they're married, but then when the spouse dies, they say, you know, what do I do now? And so one of the things that's becoming clear to me is that at every age, every stage of life, we have to evaluate what makes sense for right now. To me, the most important aspect of living your best life is making the Lord the cornerstone of your plan, the center and the core of your values. And if the Lord is your cornerstone, you will always know what to do. And if you always know what to do, that's how you have this abundant life. And part of the abundant life strategy of Jesus is not just your personal wealth, <clears throat> but how do, I, how do I view the poor? How do I view people who are not necessarily poor, but they're just suffering? And if I can figure out in my life how to minister, you, you, you say, well, Reverend, I'm not a minister, but believe me, everybody is a minister on some level or another. How can I minister to people who are suffering? I had a neighbor to die this summer, Greg, Greg McCaffrey. And I like Greg McCaffrey. He lived two doors down from me, one of the best neighbors I've ever had. Whenever Denise and I travel, I'd always call Greg up and say, Greg, can you pick up my mail? Can you pick up my newspapers? Uh, I don't want people to know that we're out of town. And the guy would always say yes. And uh, one particular time, we, Denise and I went up to the north to visit uh, some church members. Got a nice place there. And while we were there, you know, the women were doing shopping. And I'm not a big shopper. But we went to one store uh, that had outdoors clothes. And I don't know why we were in that store. But they had this, uh, I forget the name of the jacket. Some of you have seen me wear it. It's a, I have a yellow rain slicker with a hood on it. And it's a winter jacket. But we must have been there in the spring because it was the end of winter. And that jacket was on sale for $20. And Warren Buffett always says, no value when you see it. I said, that jacket during the winter, they charge $60 or $80. I said, but that's a, they're selling it for $20. They're trying to get rid of their stock. So I bought a yellow one for me and a, a white one for Greg. And uh, we came home and I gave him that jacket and I, you've never seen a happier guy. Uh, he was so happy to get that jacket, and on rainy days, he and I would put on our jackets, me with the yellow, him with the white, and uh, we just got along very well for about 20 years. But this summer, Greg died, and when Greg died, Mary Ellen, his wife, uh, is just torn up with grief. I think they have five sons, something like that, four or five sons, 
and all of them came back to be with mom. And uh, one of them stayed at the house with her. And uh, so the night of his, the night before the funeral, Denise and I went to uh, Royal Barbecue in the ghetto. Anybody know Royal Barbecue? But Royal Barbecue has some of the best fried chicken you can find <laughs> in Detroit. And so it's on Mount Elliott at East Grand Boulevard. So we went and got a big tub of chicken and we drove back to the neighborhood while Mary Ellen and her family were still there. And I got out with the big thing, a tray of chicken. And as I walked the, 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 the sidewalk and the steps up to her door, uh, the thought crossed my mind. I said, Nick, this is probably the last time you will ever see Mary Ellen here. Uh, I said, because you know she's gonna move. And, and she's getting out. And she had already bought a condo. And so I walked the steps uh, and I hand off the tray of the, the, the fried chicken, just wafting up uh, with beautiful smells and aroma. I give it to her son, her youngest son. And I hug Mary Ellen and basically said goodbye. And now why am I telling you this? Because I'm preaching about living your best life now. And for me, the best thing I could do for Mary Ellen in that instant was to give her some chicken. Now, you may laugh at that and say, Reverend, oh, you're always talking about chicken. But, you know, it's hard to mess up chicken. And, and all I could think was, it doesn't matter if you're white. It doesn't matter if you're black. Uh, if you have a sense of taste, you probably like chicken. And so here I am walking the steps to the white lady uh, and her son, and I ceremonially hand off the chicken. And they were just as pleased as could be. And as I turned around and walked back to Denise in the car, all I could think of was I said, and I'm pleased as can be. I'm pleased as can be because that's the best I could do today. I said, I can't bring Greg back. Uh, you know, I can't bring him back to life. I said, but I can give his wife some chicken. And, and the assurance that I am your friend. And so when I talk about living your best life now, what I'm saying is on every level, every level from the work to the play to our social interactions, we have to ask ourselves, what would Jesus have me to do? And in this instance, I felt like Jesus would have me bring them some chicken. And so the shape and the circumference of our aspirations and how we define success really lays the foundation for living the best life possible. If I define my success solely on the basis of how much money I make, solely on the basis of the kind of car I drive, solely on the basis of the house that I live in, uh, you will have a certain level of joy, but I believe that the day will come, and it probably won't be long from now, when you'll kick back in your nice house, lay back in your nice car, walk around in your nice clothes, and you'll have to ask yourself, how successful, how happy am I really right now? Uh, and so uh, when you arrive at that place in life with the, when you thought or what you always thought would be the pinnacle of success, if you sit back and, and try to assess your life and you come to the conclusion that maybe my life isn't as great as I thought it was, then it's time to reevaluate your faith in Jesus Christ because you're not living your best life now. Uh, I came to church today with one goal. And my goal is simply this, to encourage you to challenge yourself and ask yourself, am I living my best life right now? I spoke this week with a young woman. To me, she's young, because she's a couple years younger than I am. But I spoke with a younger woman in the church who had posted uh, a, a piece on Facebook. And what she did was she had a picture from the China trip. I think in 2017 at the church, we took about 
I don't know, 35 people to China. And I'm so glad we did it when we did it because in life, you never know uh, when you can make a trip like that. We have about 35 people signed up to go to Australia, but we had to put it off for two years because of the pandemic. But this woman posted a picture from the China trip, and it caught my eye because on the left side was my wife, Denise, in the center was our member, and on the right was her girlfriend that she had befriended at work. They met each other at work and have been friends ever since, now into their retirement. But the, and I wrote her back and I just said, you know, great photo, great memories. But what I really was thinking of was I said, and I called her later about it, I said, you know, one of the high points of that trip for me was we were walking through one of those big Chinese airports. And you know, you think everything is bigger in Texas. You look at China, you know, where you've got multiple millions of people in cities. Uh, and my memory uh, recollected back to us walking from the, uh, you know, breezeway of the airplane, the jet, and you know, you gotta go you know, this long corridor to get to your baggage. And on the way, her girlfriend had to go to the bathroom. And, which is no big thing, you know, people have to use it. And so, uh, I, I don't know why I was standing, maybe Denise had to use it, but I was standing there, uh, and instinctively, you know, because I'm one of the tour leaders, I'm saying to myself, I can't leave anybody in China. One of the places we got stuck in China at the, I don't know if this was the place, but uh, at the end of a typhoon was Wuhan. Now what came out of Wuhan? The COVID-19. We were there for a night. Uh, but, so I'm just waiting there to make sure that all the people have come out of the restroom. And this lady who wrote and posted the picture on Facebook about what a great time she had in China. She came to me with her eyes all excited. She said, Reverend Hood, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, my friend is stuck in the bathroom. Well, they were private bathrooms, very nice bathrooms. Uh, but she said, my friend is stuck and the door won't open. And so, you know, my wife always tells me that I have a doomsday kind of plan. And she says, Nick, you always go right to the end zone. I said, well, I do want to carry the ball. And I want to catch the ball. <laughs> and, and so I'm thinking, I said, we can't leave the airport with her girlfriend stuck in the bathroom. And so I go up to the door and I, and I talk to the church member. I said, did you try to get her out? She said, yes, but, you know, uh, I couldn't, couldn't get her out. And so I called into the girlfriend. I said, this is Nick, and uh, I'm going to help you get out. Now, just so you understand, their bathrooms are different than ours. So, you know, some of the bathrooms, they have just a hole in the, in the floor. This was not a hole in the floor kind of bathroom. But they just had, yeah, thank God, but they had a whole row of bathrooms. And, uh, but they were exposed to the public. But, you know, if you're behind a door, you have your privacy. And so I'm there calling out to her, and I say, you know, I'm here, and I'm going to help you get out. And I said, is the lock off the door? She said, yes. She said, but it won't open. And I said, are you pulling the door to yourself? And she said, yes. I said, wait just a minute. And I'm going to pull, is the door unlocked? She said, yes, but it won't open. I said, just wait one second. And I'm thinking and praying to myself. I'm saying, Nick, be counterintuitive. Uh, I said, the, the, your intuition is pull the door so you can exit. I said, but this needs to be counterintuitive. And you know, pull the door to you. So I said, I'm going to pull the door to me and watch what happened. And I pulled the door and it opened right up. And both of them were so happy. You know, you could have thought I had just walked on water. Uh, but the point that I'm making is if you're stuck in the bathroom and you can't get out, uh, who are you gonna call? Ghostbusters? <laughs> but
But my, my thought was, I said, I can't go to baggage claim if that lady is stuck in the bathroom. And so the point that I'm making, my friends, is I'm talking about live your best life now. Your best life now is not just to be rich. Your best life now is not just to be healthy. Your best life now is not just to have a nice car or a nice house, but at some point, what is the quality of the relationships that I am living with right now? And if I can't spare a little bit of money for the poor, if I can't spare encouragement uh, for people who are discouraged, if I can't open the toilet for a woman who can't get out of the toilet, uh, then my living is in vain. And so what I want to leave you with this day, my friends, is simply this. Live your best life now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till the end of the month. Don't wait till next year. Don't wait till you retire. But live your best life right now. And what you will find is that if you live your life, your best life right now, the God that we serve will bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Every day of my life, I'm trying to live it to the best. I'm trying to live every moment of life to the best because I don't know how long I will live. I don't know if I'll make it to 92 like my father. I don't know uh, if I'm going to be in good health or bad health. But all I do know is I'm trying to live my best life now. I'm trying to enjoy life while I can. I'm trying to smell the smells of life while they still are running fresh through my nose. I'm trying to walk the steps of life while my legs are still moving, my feet are still standing. Because I don't know when the end will come. But what I do know is that if I live my best life now, which means a life not only for Nick Hood, but a life for the poor, a life for the church, a life for the down out and the, and the left out and the shut out, if I do something of value and meaning in life, then God will bless me. God will sustain me. God will make his face to shine upon me. And at the end of the day, I care about you. But who I really care about is myself. And myself cannot enjoy life if your life is messed up. Because that is what I think Jesus is calling us when he says, I come that you might have life, that you might have life more abundantly. I want to hear the Lord one day look at me when they pull, roll back and peel back the clouds in heaven. I want the Lord to me to say, Nick, you've been faithful over a few things. Come now, enter into the joy of thy salvation. My friends, I open the doors of the church right now. Perhaps it's someone looking at this worship service. And you've been prodded into thinking, what is really the quality of my life? Are you looking at your life and asking yourself, is there something more I could and should and would be doing? What would the Lord have me to do with my life? And so my friends, I invite you to accept the call of Jesus Christ this day. We won't be in this pandemic much longer. And when we come out of this, I want you to think about joining this church. If you're already a member of the church, I want you to think about reaffirming your faith in Jesus Christ. But I invite you to come. Lamar, I'd like to ask the choir to come back. Can we do that? Yes. Choir, come back. There's a song Brother Lamar taught me when he was only about 16 years of age. He was sitting through a Bible study. He said, thank you, Lord, for giving me another chance another chance to say thank you. And as we get ready to pray, I want you to ask yourself, what am I thankful for this day? I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a moment. But I want you to open up your cell phone. And if there's somebody you want me to pray for, just type it in. And Brother Mike, you got about half a dozen names. I'm going to give you one you may or may not have. I want to pray for Suan 
Loomis, Washington, married to Ray Washington in our church. Suan's mother, Suan Loomis Sr., she died this week. We don't know the arrangements, but I'm praying for her. I'm praying for Malcolm Barnes, who had his knee replaced. I'm praying for Janetta Davis, junk, getting ready to have her knee replaced. Maybe there's somebody else you want us to pray for. Who am I praying for today, Brother Mike? You got to read it, man. <laughs> for Thoris Walton. She's praying for all the children, okay, in the schools, that they might be COVID-free. Who? I can't. You got to say it a little louder, Mike. Who else am I praying for? Washington. Tiffany Washington. Diane Rose, Connie Moore, amen. Who else, Michael? June Jeffries. June Jeffries. Now June is looking at this from somewhere between Washington, D.C. and Maryland. Shakita and, Braxton, Shakita and Braxton Simpson. Shakita and Braxton Simpson. Terrence Wright from Renee Wright. Renee Wright. Violet Dawkins praying for Ben Dawkins. Violet Dawkins is praying for Benny. Ben Dawkins. Ben Dawkins. Brown and Sandler families lost their patron. The Brown and what family? Uh, Sadler. Sadler family. Lost their patron. Lost their patron. Uh, Michael De uh, Michael Strong says she lives the best life, like you like your prayer family. Michael Strong, she's looking at this from Miami, yes, Florida. She is. Amen, yes, she Michael. Is. Amen. Well, let's uh, go into prayer now. If you can come up with some other names, you tell me a little later, Mike. Okay. Oh, Keep Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. For a thousand years in thy sight, it's like yesterday when it is past, like a watch in the night. Oh Lord God, we come to you this morning with a prayer for the sick. We pray for every person with a cancer. We pray for those with multiple sclerosis. I'm praying right now for those with the COVID-19. I'm praying today, oh Lord God, for the people who are vaccine hesitant. I'm praying for those who just insist that Joseph Biden did not win the election. I'm praying right now, oh Lord God, for every hard hit in this world. I'm praying for those who are legitimately hard hit, and I'm praying for those who are trying to create a new alternative reality. Oh Lord God, I pray right now for Harry Todd Sr recovering from the COVID. Praying for Ken Lowry. I'm praying for Terry Conaway. I'm praying right now, oh Lord God, for Ted and Jan Davis Hunt. Oh Lord God, I pray for the names that I've called, the names that I have not called. And I pray, oh Lord God, that we might live long enough to see the day when sickness no longer will reign. The day, O oh Lord God, when justice and mercy will flow like a river. I'm praying right now, Lord Jesus, for the children, that our children might have the best lives possible. I'm praying right now, O oh Lord God, for those who do not have enough food to eat. I'm praying right now for those who don't have a good place to sleep. And I'm just praying right now that each of us might find an opportunity in our lifetime to live our best lives right now. Oh Lord God, I pray for this nation. I pray for the world. And I pray for peace, happiness, and joy worldwide. I pray, oh Lord God, for every person with an organ transplant. I pray for those who are waiting to have a new organ, 
a new kid, a new heart, a new life. Oh Lord God, when we come to the end of the journey and there's nothing more that we can contribute, I ask one final blessing that like a thief in the night, you might steal our souls back into thee. Take away this life we've come to know, the love we've come to cherish. And on that last day, redeem us of our sins. Grant us life everlasting in that glorious kingdom which has no end. Amen. Here to choir, sing just a little bit. Thank you, Lord, for giving me another chance, another chance to say thank you. Sing right along with it, will you? I thank you for giving me another chance. Another chance. I thank you, Lord, for giving me. I love you, Lord. like to be a part of this church, I want you to listen to Dr. Ella Davis as she comes before us, and Dr. Davis is going to share with us the statement of faith of the United Church of Christ. Listen very carefully, because what she's talking about is what we believe about God, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about the Holy Spirit. And if you think you can be a part of a church like this, we will welcome you. Dr. Ella Davis. Good morning. Thank you, Reverend Hood. Please join me in the reading of the United Church of Christ Statement of Faith. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the world into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in the service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, 
his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. service, we lift up our offerings back to God. And uh, as I shared before, a little earlier in the service, uh, we experienced, we think about $1.7 million in flood damage to the church. And uh, that's an enormous amount of money. We don't know how much our insurance will cover. Uh, but uh, in a week or two, I'm going to start raising money for that. And you may say, why a week or two? Uh, and it's because I simply need to set the sights on where we're going. And with our trustee board and our treasurer, we're trying to figure it out. And uh, so until then, uh, keep your powder dry. Amen? Uh, and we can get through this. Uh, you know, I, I was telling somebody this week, my whole ministry has, at this church has been raising money. And this is the only church I've been at. Uh, when I first started out, I had to finish the construction mortgage for the church. $1.6 million. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we put a new roof on the church. In the dead of winter, $200,000. Uh, when the Cyprian Center uh, was trying to keep from closing, we raised $300,000 for the church. And so I'm not worried about the money. I know we can raise the money, but I want to thank those who have given an offering this day. And all but one of these envelopes has come from the gospel choir. Think about that. Uh, think about that. Uh, and so I thank you all for being here today. Amen. Uh, amen. And uh, Evelyn Hudson, come on down. And here's, here's another one, Gerald Weller. Uh, my wife tells me she hates to see me do this. I say, but Denise, uh, you know, you have to sink or swim on our own. <laughs> that is the black church. Uh, so the day is coming. But I'm going to ask now Evelyn Hudson Wright to lead us. Thank you, Deborah Gatson Jones. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, Evelyn Hudson Wright to lead us in the offertory scripture. Uh, starting next week, we're going to start bringing the children back into the church to one at a time to uh, you know, read the offering statement. But let me just say this, speaking of children, before Evelyn uh, leads us in the words of Jesus about what it means to give and how it is given to you. Let me just say, you know, I'm looking outside. When I walked into the church today, it was raining. Uh, but it's not raining right now. And why is this important? Because at 1 o'clock, we have a picnic planned for the Sunday school at my house. And uh, I called Joyce Penn, the co-superintendent of the Sunday school. I said, do you want to reschedule? She said, no. She said, the weather forecast says that it's going to be dry. So I said, okay, and that's what we're doing. And so uh, if you need my address, call me at 313-999-4492. And I will give you my address, but the picnic is going to start at my house. We're going to walk four doors from my house to Stockton Park, and then we're going to go to the playground. They have swings, five sliding boards, uh, monkey bars, Monkey Gym. Uh, they, have all, they have a climbing apparatus there. It's tremendous. And uh, so I invite you to think about bringing some child
to the Sunday school picnic today. Our Sunday school has been meeting virtually uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. We have something like, I think, four or five Sunday school rooms. And uh, so today is a day for the Sunday school to get together. And I want to introduce now to some, present to others, Evelyn Hudson Wright, who is really a minister in his own, her own right, minister, Evelyn Hudson Wright. And following the offertory, the choir is going to sing us another selection. Judge not. Judge not. And you, will not be judged. and you will not be judged. Condemn not. Condemn not. And you will not be condemned. And you will not be condemned. Forgive. Forgive. And you will be forgiven. And you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure. Good measure. Press down. Press down. Shaken together. Shaken together. Running over. Running over. Will be put into your lap. Will be put into your lap. For the measure you give, the measure you give will be the measure you get back.
to shine on you, be gracious unto you. Yeah.